Today, I'm going to talk about mobile accessibility. So the first thing I want to start with is mobile accessibility fails, the good, the bad and the ugly. And so basically, I've run a session very similar to this for the last six years about all the crazy accessibility fails and usability fails that you can see in mobile. And here are just some of them. Um, this is uh, Jamie Oliver's uh, native app, uh, recipe native app. And when you first open the app, it throws you into the video player on your mobile device. Uh, and this is a violation of WCAG 2 success criterion 2.2.2 pause stop hide. Uh, this here is an example uh, of Amazon. And of course, what do you do when you go to Amazon? You're looking to search. And the what are you looking for or the search bar is grey text and a white background. So very difficult to read and fails. We can to success criterion 1.4.3 contrast minimum. Uh, this here is an example uh, of Netflix. I do a lot of travel, well, I did before COVID. And uh, occasionally I would get this error on Netflix that was called error. And that was it. And this fails with our two success criterion 3.3.1 error identification and 3.3.3 error suggestion. Uh, this is ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. And on the left, they have, this is their native app, they have an article with its absolute smallest text, which is about six points. And on their right is the absolute largest text that you can get in app, which is about, say, 12 points. Um, and that's, that doesn't actually meet the WCAG 2 200% because the standard text is about 10 points. So it doesn't increase by 200%. So that fails the WCAG 2 success criterion 1.4.4 resize text. But the important thing to note is that if you scroll to the top of the screen, uh, if you're using the small text or the large text, the top of the screen, which has the article title, et cetera, is all the same size, whether it's small text or large text. So so the article title is the same size, the date, the time. So uh, it's not consistent. So basically, we developed a mobile testing methodology, one for mobile site and one for native app. And I'll talk about who we are in a moment. Uh, basically, what happened is the, there's a conference that occurs in October, September, or October, every year uh, called the ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium. And during that conference at the end, there's often a town hall. And this conference is aimed at accessibility testers. It's an excellent conference if you're an accessibility tester. And uh, at the town hall at the end, there's, as an industry, we would get together and talk about what is it that the industry is missing or what does it need? And so in the 2017 uh, town hall, we discussed how we really needed a standardised mobile testing methodology. We were aware that WCAG 2.1 would be released in 2018 at some stage. So we thought that this would be a short term thing, but we wanted something that uh, the accessibility companies around the world could agree on. Uh, and so uh, I was coaching of the 2017 or the 2018 committee um, and we came up with a set of guidelines. Uh, now, the, the guidelines that we released in 2018 were mobile site and native app together and we learnt uh, very quickly that that wasn't going to work. So what about WCAG 2.1? Yes, it got released in June 2018, but we found that uh, and just to step back about why WCAG 2 doesn't uh, um, apply to mobile, everything that's in WCAG 2 you can uh, um, test on mobile, but it really does miss some major mobile accessibility requirements. So, for example, uh, WCAG 2 requires that sites be accessible to the keyboard user, but it doesn't specify that it should also be accessible to the touchscreen user. And this is one of the things that WCAG 2.1 did address. So WCAG 2.1 builds on this, talks about things like pointer gestures, sensors and small screen devices. However, as a committee, we really felt that it didn't go far enough. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, is touch target size requirement, which requires that an item has a, a specific touch target size on a mobile device. That is in WCAG 2.1, but it's at the AAA level, which mostly means that it gets ignored.
Uh, so at the end of 2018, we convened two more committees for 2019, one uh, to develop mobile site testing guidelines and one to develop native app testing guidelines. So why is mobile different to desktop? Firstly, desktop has a whole bunch of different screen readers. People can build their own screen reader, whereas mobile, you're restricted to what comes inherent in the actual device. So you're talking about native screen readers such as TalkBack on Android, Narrator on Windows for anyone who has a Windows phone, um, VoiceOver on iOS. And of course, there are things like Voice Assistant on Samsung, but uh, there's really not much more than that. There's, of course, volume control, um, vibrational keyboards, uh, visual auditory vibrational notifications, text-to-speech, speech recognition, uh, Zoom and dark mode and things like that in iOS 13. There's also system accessibility settings that are quite different to what you would experience on desktop. Uh, font size of, often operates very different to desktop in terms of using two finger touch, uh, touch and hold delay, screen rotation. We're very used to seeing things on a desktop in a horizontal rectangular display, but on mobile, most of the times the display is vertical. And you see that of course, when you watch videos that have been uh, videoed on a mobile and then played on a desktop. Uh, there's a whole lot of dead space. Then there's things like assistive touch and mono audio. One of the things that I want to mention is page variations. So one of the problems with mobile is that it kind of uh, falls into this page variations requirement. So often what you see on a desktop is completely different to what you see on a mobile. And it's basically the same page, but it's there's two different variations of a page. And often these variations or these mobile views can be triggered on the desktop by increasing text size. Most of the time, uh, a variation is triggered by screen size. And so if you increase text size, it actually mimics the small screen size and as a result you can end up being restricted to a mobile view of a site on the desktop. Um, so for example it, previously in YouTube they have fixed this. They upload a notifications button uh, were available at 100% screen size but if you increase the screen size on your desktop to 200% they would disappear. Um, and that would mean that people who had to increase the text size because of low vision wouldn't actually be able to upload videos on desktop. So this is what the desktop looks like at 100% text size. Your upload notifications are in the top right-hand corner. And uh, when it's at 200%, they disappear. And why do they disappear? Because it's assumed that you'd be looking at this on a mobile device. And therefore, if you were going to upload videos, you would use the YouTube mobile app. But of course, if you're on a desktop and you're in low vision, then you don't have that opportunity. Uh, the other thing uh, is that 2.1 stresses uh, accessibility supported, which was required in 2.0, but basically it says that whatever techniques that a technology has that assists accessibility need to be used. So when it comes to things like native apps, what this means is that you really must be testing with assistive technologies uh, because there's no actual access to the code like there is with a mobile site. It's much more important that you do testing with assistive technology. And I'm a big believer in making sure that assistive technology testing is done by people with disabilities who are reliant on those assistive technologies. So because we didn't want to uh, spend 10 years writing it, one of the things we really wanted to do when it came to this methodology is make sure that it iterated quickly is we didn't include things that are in Wicab 2. So, for example, you know, images requiring alt attributes are not, are not included in this methodology because that's a Wicab 2 requirement. However, things that were added in 2.1 have been added to the methodology. It's very clear when something is all also a WCAG 2.1 requirement, but we didn't want to uh, have people that were, you know, required to be WCAG 2 compliant and wanted to make their mobile accessible, then, you know, miss the 2.1 stuff that was in there. Uh, if there's one thing you take away from this course, uh, it is to test with real devices. 
So I've always travelled for work, but about six years ago, I started uh, travelling to the US um, for work. And uh, it's a 15 hour flight, if you're lucky, 15 and a half, if you're not lucky, from Australia to the US. And uh, this was before you could get Wi Fi on aeroplanes. And so it would often be quite a struggle for me to be awake that long and not on the internet. It's amazing how much you use the internet for. And uh, so we'd often land uh, at LAX and we'd actually sit on the tarmac for half an hour, maybe two hours while they waited for a gate uh, to open. Now, when we were on the tarmac, you could actually access Wi-Fi in LAX. And the first time I flew to the States in 2014, this is what I did when I tried to connect to Wi-Fi. So this is the Wi-Fi internet access for LAX. And it says, this page will redirect. So content doesn't really make sense to have here. And all of a sudden, I don't feel really safe about giving you my credit card details or logging into my bank account or accessing my email. So if there's one thing that you take away from this session, it's that you must test with real devices. There's just myriad of examples of people who have been testing on a big screen and you actually look at it on a mobile device, you can't read it at all. Or it's a location app and, you know, you find you're in one place and it won't actually tell you where you are or something along those lines. You must test with real devices. So uh, the first thing we talked about was testing methods. So what testing methods are you going to use if you're going to test a mobile site or native app? For mobile sites, there are four main testing methods. Uh, so devices, which is testing on mobile and the tablet devices. Devices with assistive technologies, so testing on mobile and tablet devices with assistive technologies. Responsive window, there are some times where you can test on a responsively sized window on your desktop. And this can be useful because uh, it can mean accessing the code and things like that, taking screenshots easier, etc. And then there is actually a requirement to test on a normally sized desktop window. It's really important to compare a website uh, on the desktop to what it is on mobile. With native apps, we, although there are some testing tools out there, some of them are free, we weren't particularly impressed with any of them. Um, so the, the methodology talks only about two main testing methods when it comes to native app testing. Devices, which is testing on the mobile and tablet devices, and devices with assistive technologies, which is testing on the mobile and tablet devices with assistive technologies. So the actual methodology, uh, the mobile site and the native app methodology are very similar with the exception of step two. So there are five steps. Step one is identify devices. For the mobile site methodology, step two is identify site type and variations. Step three is test critical issues. Step four is test mobile specific issues. And step five is test mobile assistive technology and feature support. For native apps, it's exactly the same except step two is define application functionality. And I'll talk about this in a moment. So let's start with identifying devices. The recommended devices and browser combinations are iPhone with Safari, iPad with Safari, and Android phone with Chrome. And we go into why we've chosen that, those and why we don't think, you know, the Samsung internet browser is a good idea, et cetera, in the documentation. So have a look at that and let us know what you think. You should consider, especially if it's a native app, uh, you should consider testing with an Android tablet. Um, and, you know, if you're going to test a mobile site, make sure it's with Chrome again. Uh, and also consider testing with alternative devices such as a Kindle if you are testing a ebook, for example. In terms of versions, you should test on the latest version of iOS and the latest two versions of Android. Where a site is directly aimed at people with a particular kind of disability, consider including assistive technologies and or other assistive devices used by potential users. So if you have a site aimed at switch users, then you should really consider testing with the keyboard and switch options in your mobile and tablet devices. Just uh, Again, you need to meet WCAG 2 and this mobile testing methodology. So uh, you can't just meet the me mobile testing methodology and be accessible. You need to, you know, make sure your headings are coded, your tables have table headers, etc. 
The second step is to identify the site type and variations of the page in the mobile site methodology. So the first thing is to determine if the site is a desktop site, a responsive site or an MDOT site. And if the site is responsive, are there variations of the page? Now, what do I mean? Desktop websites, they have only one display, whether they're viewed on desktop or mobile or tablet devices. MDOT sites have a particular display for mobile and tablet sites. The MDOT site must be tested across all of WCAG 2 and the WW W version needs to be tested against the mobile methodology as well. Don't assume just because there's an MDOT site that someone won't get to your WWW site on the mobile device. Uh, and responsive sites. This is much more likely, much more likely to have a responsive site than any other site. Um, and they change depending on the screen size or other feature as determined by the developer. So this is an example of a desktop site. This is the Australian National Botanic Gardens. You've got your um, navigation on the left, you've got a header, you've got a beautiful picture in the middle and some text. Now, this is viewed on a desktop. Now, if you make the screen size smaller by just dragging the edge of the window to the left, you find that nothing actually changes. You just cut off a whole lot of information as if the information is underneath the scroll bar. That's a desktop site. So let's have a look at an MDOT site. So this is the Sephora uh, website. Uh, you can see it's split into four sections. It's very brown. It's got nice pictures. It's got navigation along the top in a horizontal row. This is what it looks like on desktop. Now, if I replace www.sephora.com with m.sephora.com, this is what I see. The navigation is replaced with a hamburger menu. The search bar goes across the entire screen. There's no brown. There's only one image. It's very blue, etc. So very different sites. Now, if I look at these two sites on mobile, the left is the, the www site and the right is the m.dot site the m.dot site is much more mobile friendly but you can still get the desktop site on mobile okay responsive websites it's very likely that the site is responsive if a site is responsive it's definitely not a desktop site but it's possible unlikely but possible that there might also be an m.dot site the site is responsive if the layout changes as you change the browser window size. To test this, open the website in a browser on your desktop, ensure the window is not maximised, select the right hand edge and drag it to the centre of the screen. And detailed instructions on how to do this is in the documentation. So this is an example of a responsive site. This is the Accessibility Oz website, and you can see that our navigation is uh, horizontal across the top. We've got six service icons by one. Now, if we make that screen smaller, what you'll see is the navigation changes to a hamburger menu, and the services are now rows of two instead of a row of six. Moving on to native app, step two for native app is to find application functionality. You need to really think about what your native app is doing. So a native app has much more targeted functionality than say a mobile site. If you're looking at say the Wells Fargo mobile site, it'll have a store locator, it'll have a section on home loans, it'll have a section on opening a bank account, it might have a section on investor relations, uh, etc. or even applying for a job. However, the Wells Fargo banking app isn't going to have a lot of those things. It will be specifically about maintaining your bank account, transferring money, checking um, balances, authorizing users, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what you need to really focus on. Ask the question, how would the experience be impact if the functionality failed, the content could not be reached, or the experience caused a barrier to the user? Now, everything on a native app needs to be tested. However, in terms of prioritizing your testing, that's where you need to look at the critical functionality. There are common elements on a lot of uh, native apps that you just generally absolutely need to test. Things like navigation, landing screens, emergency sections, login flows, settings, accounts and profile, contact us, real-time updates, you know, like for Uber or eBay, 
privacy policy, terms and conditions, interactional functionality, help section widgets such as calendars, geolocational maps, high traffic areas, etc. And step three is test the critical issues. So we broke these out because these were really serious problems. Um, what we found is that there's, there are a lot more what we call traps in mobile sites and native apps than we found on desktop. So a trap is where a user is trapped within a component and can't escape without closing the browser or the app. An example on desktop would be a keyboard trap where you say tab into a video player and you can't tab out of it. Uh, and so the only way that a keyboard user can escape is to actually close the browser and start again. So we actually found quite, quite a few new traps on mobile sites and native apps and these are the ones we found. The first one is the exit trap. Ensure there is always an accessible, actionable item, e.g. a close button that meets colour contrast requirements and has an accessible name that closes any feature that overlays the current page, such as a full page ad. This applies to all users and the methodology is both mobile site and native app. This is an example here. You're on Facebook um, and it throws up an ad at you and there's no actual way to close that ad. Um, so it's basically you're trapped and you have to close Facebook and start again. Uh, this here is the San Francisco Chronicle. And when you go to the website, it pulls up a, an ad with this tiny little close button that doesn't meet color contrast requirements. And so we would classify that as an exit trap because there will be some users who won't be able to see that close button and therefore won't be able to escape that trap. Then we have the swipe or scroll trap. Ensure you do not override standard mobile touch functions, swiping, scrolling, etc., on the majority of the page. This applies to touch users and mobile site and native app users. So this is an example, I've only seen this once, but basically if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you can't scroll up. The only thing you can do is activate this little arrow in the bottom right hand corner and that throws you back to the top of the page. So that's an example of a swipe or a scroll trap. This is what I call the zoom of doom. Uh, so this is a map that takes up almost the entirety of the page. And the only way to actually scroll the page instead of the map is to hit these small areas of white around the side of the map. Now, uh, a lot of maps now are doing this thing where you have to use two fingers to scroll the map. One finger will scroll the page. That's great. So we're seeing that these things are improving. This is, this is a very old example. A text to speech trap. If the app has an ability to provide content via text-to-speech, the screen reader user must be able to pause or stop the app speaking in a simple manner, e.g. by performing a swipe on a screen. This applies to screen reader users only and the methodology is native app only. So this is an example of Pocket where you can tap and you can listen to an article, but once you've actually started listening to the article, there's no easy way for a screen reader user to pause the audio. And if they pause using the normal methods to pause the audio, it will pause their screen reader. It won't pause the text to speech, which is similar to a headset trap. Headset users must always be able to pause media, audio or video content by using the pause, play, control on the headset. This applies to screen reader users and headset users and the methodology is mobile site and native app. So this is an example here where you go to a web page and at the bottom you have this little video that pops up and starts playing and it has a little pause icon there, but you can only access that if you tap on it. If you pause using the headset, it pauses the screen reader. It doesn't pause the audio that's playing. And we have the layer trap the user should not be trapped on a non-visible layer. Uh, this does apply to all users. However, it's mostly encountered by screen reader users and its methodology is both mobile site and native app. And so this is an example here where you've got dispatch.com. When you open the hamburger menu, the hamburger menu pops out, but the screen reader is trapped on the layer underneath and will read the home page. Won't actually be able to access any of the menu items. So let's see an example from the document 
I want to show you that you might go, oh, wow, this is a whole lot of information and I'm not sure if I understand all this, but there's a lot of information in the documents, examples, etc. So if you ever do look through stuff and information's not there, let us know because they are working documents. So the one that I want to talk about are touch gestures. Uh, so the requirement in the methodology is any touch gesture must have an alternative accessible actionable item. For more information, see success criterion 2.5.1 pointer gestures. So it's very similar to uh, WCAG 2.1. And if it's different, then we specify in the actual name how it's different. So examples of touch gestures are things like swiping up and down or left and right, dragging up and down or left and right, double tapping, tapping and holding, tapping and swiping, two pinch zoom and press and long hold. Alternative accessible gestures must meet WCAG 2. They must meet change of state, uh, touch targets, inactive space, native UI and removal of touch. And those are all mobile methodology requirements. So you can look at those in detail. Some examples of alternative and accessible gestures are a link or a button or a drop down or a separate page with the same functionality. And then we have a section about this requirement. This requirement is particularly important for screen reader users. For example, if you require your user to swipe right to complete a purchase, when the screen reader is on, the swipe right gesture moves you to the next focusable item and doesn't complete the purchase. You must be able to perform the same action by using a link, an up and down swipe or some other gesture. Please note that this requirement is similar to the exit trap requirement. However, a failure of the exit trap requirement is that a user cannot escape from the content or a page. A failure of the touch gestures requirement is that the user cannot choose content or a page. I, they're not trapped, but they can't proceed. And then we have a section that says how to test. Uh, identify any site controls. If they require any of the following gestures, is there an accessible actionable item provided as an alternative? And then it lists the gestures that you need to test. And so then we have an example here where the alternative is provided on another page. So this is weather.com and you've got uh, top stories and you can see that as the second picture is cut off, that if you swipe from right to left, that you actually get additional stories. However, there's also a link at the bottom that says see more. And if you tap on that link, you get exactly the same content in an accessible way. So just vertically listed as you would if you were swiping. Uh, this is another example where a tap alternative is provided instead of a drag gesture. This is google.com weather. And you can drag the slider to determine what the weather is going to be at that particular time. So that requires, of course, a drag gesture. However, if you tap on the actual numbers instead, then you get the same information. So basically a link has been provided there. Then we have uh, mobile specific issues and they're broken into different sections like alternatives and display and actionable items. I'm just going to give you some examples, but all of them are very much detailed in the documentation. Uh, so alternatives. Uh, alternatives are provided for geolocation functionality that is mandatory. For example, requiring a specific geolocation before functionality appears, unless the geolocation is essential for legal reasons or doing so would invalidate the activity. This applies to geolocation via GPS, user statement, IP address or other methods. So this here is IKEA um, in Australia and I was accessing it when I was overseas and it said we want to access your location and I was like oh, I don't want you to do that because I'm not in Australia and so I blocked the location and I get this error that says info location service is not enabled for this app please go to settings and enable it limited functionality of app doesn't tell you what's not going to work and it really shouldn't matter whether I'm actually located in that place or not. Uh, this is an example of a pass. Uh, this is Lyft. I was in Portland and as you can see I'm located in the top here uh, in northeast Portland but I can actually set up Lyft to pick me up from a different location from where I'm currently located and this is really important for say people who have carers that might be setting someone to pick them up or things like that so to not force that the same location is where you're being picked up. 
Changes of state of non-standard controls, e.g. hamburger menus and star ratings are clearly indicated. So this is the United app and the hamburger menu when it's closed is a little hamburger menu and its alt attribute is open menu. Uh, and when the menu is open, it actually changes state. It becomes a backwards arrow. It's not looking exactly the same. That's because it does a different thing now. It closes the menu and the alternative text for that is close menu. Then we have display. Actionable items have sufficient inactive space between them. In active space, at least 10 pixels should be provided around active elements. Uh, so this is an example, edit and mark complete. Uh, right next to each other, it's very easy to mark something complete instead of editing it. There's not enough inactive space, uh, but you really shouldn't have complete opposite actions that close together. Actionable items. Native UI controls, objects, alerts, and elements have been used. This is absolutely essential for native apps because native controls have inbuilt accessibility. And if you don't do it, you end up with something like this, where your expiration date seems to think it's a text field, has a drop down of 14, 15, 16, 17, um, instead of just being a select box. So much easier. When direct input via the keyboard is not required, provide options for the user to achieve the same results, I use a drop down radio buttons and check boxes. So this here is an example where it's prime now, um, the country is the United States, but you have to type in the state. Now that's just asking for mistakes. There's only 50 states in the United States, there's like six or seven, depending on who you ask in Australia, that should really be a drop down. And so that's one of the methodology failures. This here is an, another example of doing it where you type in the address and it starts feeding through an auto drop down what that address should be. So you don't need to type it all in. Navigational aids, visual indicators such as arrows, next and previous buttons have been used to indicate swipe or scroll areas or additional functionality. And this is very similar to 2.5.1 pointer gestures. So here, this is a BBC and you're on the top stories. And if you swipe from right to left, you move to the My News. But there's no indication that that swipe is what's going to, you know, actually do that. Navigational aids such as back buttons, breadcrumbs, next and previous buttons have been provided. This is also a failure of navigational aids. This is iTunes on Android. Basically, to close this, you actually swipe from the top to the bottom, but there's no indication that that's what you need to do. And in iTunes on iOS, there is. Audio and video. Uh, one of the things that we require is that all audio and video have a transcript. Forms. Field labels are positioned adjacent to their input field and appear closest to their respective input fields in relation to other field labels and other input fields, which basically means don't do this, which is where you have yes, and then you have a radio button, and the radio button for yes is actually closer to the field label no than it is to yes. And then we need to test mobile desktop interaction. Of course, this is only for the mobile sites. Item labeling between different types of a site, desktop, MDOT and responsive, and different variations of a responsive site is consistent. And so this is an example here of Asana, where on desktop, I would only operate using my tasks and on the mobile app, there is no my tasks. And then the last step is to test mobile assistive technology and feature support. Basically, there's just one requirement, but you need to test it on a whole bunch of different assistive technologies and mobile features. And that is all actionable items and important content can be accessed and activated by the following assistive technologies or when the following feature is enabled. And there are step-by-step -step instructions on how to use all these different features. So on iOS, we're talking about voiceover, keyboard, keyboard and switch, zoom, invert colors, grayscale and reader view. On Android, we're talking about talkback, keyboard, keyboard and switch, magnification, invert colors, grayscale, increased text size and simplified view. And if you're interested in learning more about these, the best place to find them is the Accessibility Oz website. So if you go to resources and then mobile testing, here we've got a little bit of introduction, 
about we had two mobile versus native apps and then we've got these documents for mobile sites and documents for native app so there are five documents for each type first one is the methodology itself the second is about mobile site testing or about native app testing so how you capture errors site types variations of the page etc then we have the critical test cases, the mobile test cases, and the test cases for assistive technologies and mobile features. So thank you very much. And I'm open for questions now.